Should we dive into the tech stock frenzy or stay on the sidelines? Join us as we unlock the wisdom of legendary investors Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Discover their insights on navigating the ever-evolving tech landscape and gain valuable nuggets to guide your investment decisions. Get ready to sharpen your strategy and unlock your financial potential. Let's dive in. Well, it's been an interesting development during that period. It goes back a little bit before that period, but, but you now have the four largest companies by market value uh, in the United States, the $30 trillion market, you have four companies that essentially don't need any net tangible assets. Uh, and if you go back many years, I mean, if you looked at the largest company, Carol used to put out the Fortune 500 list and, uh, you know, it would be AT&T or General Motors and it was companies that, Exxon Mobil, it was companies that just required lots of capital in order to produce earnings. So uh, American industry has gotten incredibly more profitable in aggregate in the last 20 or 30 years. You look at the return on the S&P 500, the earnings as a percent of net tangible assets, and the rest is just, you know, if you buy a company that has a million dollars worth of net worth and you pay a billion for it, it still only had the million dollars of net worth. I mean, you just paid more for it. So in the, the basic profitability of the company is huge, even though you, you, your investment may be at a significantly higher price. And so that what has happened is that, uh, I think if you look at the earnings on tangible net worth of the S&P 500, and compared to 20 years ago, it is amazing. And that is really due to the fact that this has become somewhat, you could call it an asset light economy. And, uh, you know, those four companies that earn 10% of, of the, of the, uh, uh, they comprise close to 10% of the, the market value of the entire uh, publicly traded corporate America, they don't, and they don't take any money, basically. And that, that is a changing world, and, and uh, they will earn even more money with the uh, tax rate going down. And, and I don't think people have quite processed all that information in, in terms of what has gone on in the, in the market. You don't, you know, Carnegie, built a steel mill and then he paid it off or he, he borrowed a little money and then he built another steel mill and all of that sort of thing. But it was enormously capital intensive. And uh, one industry after another, AT&T was enormously capital intensive. Uh, and now the money is in the asset light. I mean, huge money is in the, not only asset light business, but the, the negative asset, you, you know, IBM, uh, even, you know, it has no tangible, there's a net minus tangible net worth. There's nothing wrong with that. It's terrific. But uh, it, is, it is not the world we lived in uh, 30 years ago. And in that sense, I didn't see that coming in 1999 when I wrote whatever I wrote there. It hasn't changed the profitability of the asset-heavy companies, particularly. I mean, it isn't like oil. You take the five most capital-intensive industries in the 90s, I don't think you'll find that their, their earnings on tangible assets have increased a lot. But you will find that this group has moved in that, that really doesn't, they don't need any, they don't need any net tangible assets uh, at all, or they need very minor amounts. Charlie? There's also a lot of financial engineering that's raised leverage, even in the capital intense businesses. And, you know, well, Warren may have predicted a little wrong when he wrote that very scholarly article. He didn't invest wrong. <laughs> and so it just shows it's hard to make these economic predictions. The American economy has become increasingly asset light 
meaning companies are generating significant profits without the need for large amounts of tangible assets. This shift is evident in the rise of companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, and Facebook, which are among the largest companies by market value but have minimal net tangible assets. The profitability of the S&P 500 has increased significantly over the past 20-30 years, largely due to this shift. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to not miss the new videos. Thank you. Traditional capital-intensive industries like steel and oil have also seen an increase in profitability, but not to the same extent as asset light businesses. Charlie Munger adds that financial engineering has played a role in raising leverage even in capital-intensive businesses. Key takeaways. Investors need to adapt their strategies to account for the changing landscape of the economy. Asset light businesses offer the potential for higher returns on capital and greater scalability than capital-intensive businesses. The shift to an asset light economy is likely to continue in the future, driven by technological innovation and changes in consumer behavior. Overall, the comments from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger highlight a significant trend in the American economy and offer valuable insights for investors. But uh, I'm wondering about your interest in not just Apple, but all of the tech stocks like Amazon and Google, because you've avoided them, you stated in the past, because they're complicated, you should stick with something you understand. On the other hand, Amazon and Google have what you call a very durable competitive advantage. They really hardly have any competitor. And that's true in China, too, of Alibaba and Tencent. So it seems like it's a conflict, and I'm wondering if you're going to be turning the corner and going into these tech companies that seem to have no serious competition. Well, we certainly looked at them, and we, we, we don't think of whether we should be in tech companies or not or that sort of thing. We, we are looking for things where we, we do get into the durability of the competitive advantage and whether we think that our opinion is, might be better than other people's opinion in assessing the probability of the durability, in the, uh, so to speak. Uh, but the truth is that uh, I've watched Amazon from the start, and I, I think what Jeff Bezos has has done is something close to a miracle. And, and the problem is if I think something will be a miracle, I tend not to bet on it. Uh, the, uh, uh, it would have been better, far better, obviously, if, we, if I'd had some insights into certain businesses. But, you know, in fact, Bill told me early on, Bill Gates told me early on, you know, that that I think I was on all of this, and he suggested I turn to Google. But the trouble is, I I saw that Google was was uh, was skipping past all of this, and then I wondered if anybody could skip past Google. So, and I saw at Geico that we were paying a lot of money for something that cost them nothing incrementally. So we've looked at it, and you know, I made a mistake in in in, in not being able to come to a conclusion where I really felt that, that at the present prices that, that the prospects were far better than the prices indicated. And uh, uh, I didn't go into Apple because it was a tech stock in the least. I mean, I, I went into Apple because I made certain, came to certain conclusions about, about both the intelligence with, with the capital would be employed, but more important, about the value of an ecosystem and how permanent that ecosystem could be and what the threats were to it and a whole bunch of things. And uh, that didn't, I don't think that required me to, you know, take apart an iPhone or something and figure out what all the components were or anything. It, it, it was more, it's much more the nature of consumer behavior. And some things uh, strike me as having a lot more permits than others. But the answer is we'll miss a lot of things that, or I'll miss a lot of things that that I don't feel I understand well enough. And there's, there's, there is no penalty in investing if you don't swing a, a ball that's in the strike zone. As long as you swing at something at some point, and you know, eventually that you find the pitch 
pitches you like. And that's the way we'll continue to do it. We'll try to stay within our circle of competence. And, and uh, Charlie and I generally agree on, on uh, sort of where that circle ends and uh, what, what kind of situations where we might have some kind of an edge in our reasoning or our experience or something that uh, where we might evaluate something differently than other people. But the answer is uh, we're going to miss a lot of things. Charlie? Yeah, we have a wonderful system. If one of us is stupid in some area, so is the other. <laughs> and of course, we were not ideally located to be high-tech wizards. You know, uh, how many people of our age quickly mastered Google? I've been to Google headquarters. They look to me like they're, it looks like a kindergarten. <laughs> a very rich kindergarten. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily impressive what they've done. And uh, like I said, the Geico, we were paying them a lot of money uh, at the time they went public. and, and and all three of them, the main characters, Eric and Larry and Sergei, uh, they actually came and saw me, but they were more than talking about going public and the mechanics of it and various things along that line. But it wasn't like what they were doing was a mystery to me. The mystery was how much competition would come along and how effective they would be uh, and whether it would be a game where four or five people were slugging it out without making as much money as they could if one company dominated. Those are, those are tough decisions to make. You can have industries where there's only two people in it and they still aren't very, very good because they beat each other's brains out. And that's one of the questions in the airline business. It's, it's a better business now than it used to be, but <laughs> it used to be suicide. So, uh, and you know that the competitive, invo uh, the competitive factors are are extraordinary in in airlines and how much better business is it with with uh, four people operating at 85 percent capacity than it was it with seven or eight operating in the mid 70s and with more planes around those are tough decisions but uh i made the wrong decision on on google and amazon i just i really consider that a miracle that you could be doing amazon web services and and changing retail at the same time uh, with, you know, without enormous amounts of capital and do it with the speed and effectiveness of what Amazon has done. I just, I would, I underestimated. Uh, I had a very, very, very high opinion of Jeff's ability when I first met him, and I underestimated him. <laughs> Charlie? Well, my comment would be that the shareholders have one thing to be thankful for. Some of the age-related stupidity at headquarters has been ameliorated by Ted and Todd joining us. We are looking at the world with the aid of some younger eyes now, and they've had a contribution Significant. beyond their own investments. And so you're, you're very lucky to have them, you shareholders, because there's a lot of ignorance in the older generation that needs removal. In summary, Buffett acknowledges the attractiveness of tech companies like Amazon and Google, but emphasizes the importance of investing within one's circle of competence. He admits to misjudging the potential of Google and Amazon, calling them miracles he didn't fully understand. Apple was an exception because its success stemmed from its ecosystem and consumer behavior, which Buffett felt he understood well. Buffett and Munger both acknowledge their limitations in understanding technology, highlighting the benefit of having younger partners like Ted Weschler. They believe in only investing in companies where they have an edge in their understanding or analysis. Missing some opportunities is acceptable as long as they invest wisely within their circle of competence. Key takeaways. Investing requires self-awareness and understanding your limitations. Focus on companies you understand and can analyze effectively. 
Don't be afraid to admit mistakes and learn from them. Having diverse perspectives and younger voices can be valuable for investors. Overall, Buffett and Munger offer valuable insights on the importance of investing within your circle of competence and avoiding chasing opportunities you don't fully understand. While they acknowledge missing out on some tech giants, they emphasize the importance of disciplined and informed investing. We advocate that you watch our next video. This video is going to help you speed up your success step by step. So go ahead, click this, and get on the faster track. Until next time, happy investing. Your views are important to us. Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. Thank you.